at our uh, weekly seminar. Our speaker today is uh, Piotr Grochowski. Piotr is a PhD student of uh, Professor Szymczewski. And today he will tell us about quantum Carpets. Okay. Mionic <laughs> quantum Carpets. Yeah. Yeah, so as, as you can see from this picture, I'm going to tell you about the quantum carpets that are woven by, two f by fermions. So this is a project that we are doing the collaboration with uh, our friends from the University of Białystok, Tomek Karpiuk and Mirek Wrewczyk. So this topic was kind of su surprising for us as it, was, it started during the summer and this is the time in which there are many summer students that want to, that want to do uh, internships. So we had a summer student who was assigned quite a simple task. He was supposed to study dynamics of ideal Fermi gas. Ideal Fermi gas that was put inside the infinite potential well, uh, a box. He was supposed to study initial conf configuration in which the gas was put in half of the box and then release to the bigger one, to the, the whole box. And this is what we saw. I'm going to show you a movie. Beautiful! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is the uh, this is the box. We have a okay. I have to click it in here, and as you can see, as you can see, it just fills like after there is some initial diffusion, it just fills the whole box, and we can see these uh, peculiar structures that have constant velocity when they when they move, uh, have a cons uh, constant shape and relatively constant depth. They basically are look, uh, they behave like solitons. So, but they are not solitons because in order to have a soli so solitons, we, we, have, we need to have some non-linearity non in, the, in, the, in our equations. But still, it's quite kind of su surprising. But later in the lecture, we identify this structure which has like larger, uh, larger density with a bright structure, which, uh, which is analog to the bright soliton, and here this will be a gray or a dark soliton-like structure. And hey, it's kind of surprising to see s structures like this in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the ideal gas, because you don't get any new phenomena in ideal. Uh, how do you remove the it's, 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 it's infinitely fast, yeah. Yeah, this is a su sudden change of the uh, of the. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, so this is the, the sudden removal of the barrier in the in between. So uh, let me start with the outline of this presentation. Uh, I will start with some historical introduction to the topic. Then I will present our results that start with the one-dimensional ideal Fermi gas for which I. Uh, show you some analytical results, and then I will try to say something more about the more realistic setups within the full three-dimensional system. And then I will go beyond that and s a considered interacting case with a two-component 1D repulsive Fermi gas. So let me start with the 19th century, with the story about the Talbot effect and this guy, William Henry Fox Talbot, who was not a physicist. He was everything that we would we, all of us would like to be if we were a man in the 19th century with a lot of money. So he was a philanthropist, he was a, he was a mathematician, he was a linguist, he was, like, he was traveler and all this stuff. But he is mo most, most, uh, he, he's most well known by the fact that he was a father of the modern photography along this Frenchman Daguerre. So, among the other, he, he was conducting a lot of experiments, optical experiments, and one of them was uh, when he was, uh, had a diffraction grating, and he was looking at this diffraction grating through the magnifying glass. And what he was expecting, that he should see this diffraction grating in focus at some distance. But when he was moving away, he was seeing this diffraction grating in focus at some repeated distances, now called the Talbot effect. And now they call, call the Talbot distance. So he presented this uh, result to the Royal Society, and he was forgotten for 50 years. Up to the 
end of the uh, 19th century, in, uh, in 1881, Lord Ryler wrote, uh, presented a paper to the, uh, to the Royal Society in which he calculated this uh, effect with the, with the Fresnel diffraction, which, which, uh, which was back then already available. So he uh, performed this calculation and he connected the, this Talbot distance with a uh, wavelength of the incident light and, uh, and the spacing in this diffraction grating between the slits. So it was again forgotten for many years until it, it was realized after introduction of the quantum mechanics that is connected to the well known, well, to the phenomenon called the quantum revival. Uh, as you can probably realize by now, this Talbot effect is only due to the, co uh, the coherence, interference of the coherent waves. So this, this, this is just a normal wave, uh, wave, wave phenomenon. So in 1980s, or like before 1980s, there was a renowned person, a renowned, right now renowned physicist, who, was, uh, who, who found out a really curious result. In some model that he, uh, he, wa uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was checking, he had like this curious revival of the quantum state, but his but his supervisor told him that it's just a numerical artifact. <laughs> so it was it was it waited for a couple of years until 1980, where uh, when a PhD student of Joe Eberly uh, Sanchez Mondragon uh, realized that he 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 can see a quantum revival. I'm gonna tell you in a moment what a quantum revival is in a simple James Cumming model. So if if I say quantum re revival, what I mean? Let us imagine an uh, electron. Uh, an electron, which can be associated with a highly excited wave packet. Let's put it, this wave packet at the classical orbit around the nucleus. So we put it on this classical orbit and due, the, due to the correspondence between the quantum and classical physics, we know if it's highly excited, it has to go around this classical orbit. But what happens? Uh, it of course goes around this classical orbit, but it, but it spreads along this classical orbit and eventually fills all of this orbit. But it happens after some time that this initial wave packet that was localized contracts again and reproduces the initial state. This is what we call a quantum revival. So this was realized in this, as I said, James Cummings model in 1980. Uh, by, by Sanchez Mondragon, Narożny and uh, Eberly. And it was then, I would say, an outbreak or many, f or, or a theoretical research that, uh, that bore witness to a, uh, to a birth of many ideas that are connected to this qu uh, quantum revivals and that are known under different names. So we have a quantum fractals first introduced by, the, my, my, by Michael Berry. This is this Berry by, from the Berry phase. And it was uh, also studied in our institute by his PhD stu student. I don't know his name. It's, he was D. Wojcik, so Damian on Daniel Wojcik. And here is Professor Rzeczkowski and Professor Białyniski in this paper. And also we have quantum echoes, quantum Talbot effect, quantum scars, and if you are Im interested in this topic, uh, you can check this really nice review by Robinet that's from 2004, Quantum Wave Packet Revival. It's really pedag pedagogical and it's really nice. But we are interested in something different. We're interested in the phenomenon called a quantum carpet. So what a quantum carpet is? Let us imagine um, the same situation I showed you before, a box, but this time with only one quant uh, one particle, so it's described by a 1D Schrodinger equation, and we would like to put it in some excited say, let's say a localized wave packet inside, inside this box. And then uh, we plot a spatio-temporal profile of the density probability, like in the horizontal axis, in the horizontal axis, or in the horizontal axis we have a position, Oort's coordinate, and in the vertical axis we have time. So if we plot the probability density, we had this funny, funny looking uh, pattern, which is now called a quantum carpet. And as you can see, it was firstly, it was firstly seen in 1995 by Wolfgang Kinzelt and published in some half popular 
let's say quite a minor uh, German uh, German journal. Uh, yeah, Blätter. Yeah, Blätter. And uh, and as you can see in this picture, this this is not a very good quality. But you can see like these parts in which uh, we have these lines of less density and these lines of let's say higher than probability density. And back then they weren't like the, the name quantum carpet didn't exist. This is one dimension. This is one dimension. This is one dimension and here is time. So Kinzel thought of this as a mountain view. So he called these dark lines uh, canals or valleys and these bright lines in here uh, ridges. So you can see why, right, from this picture, from the perspective. So this, uh, this realization uh, mm, uh, preceded much theoretical work and there was, there was some names that were especially interesting in that topic. And I guess like the guy who pushed the whole topic forward and published a lot of papers with his group was Wolfgang Schleich. There was also Michael Berry in Mar Barsoli and uh, from, our, from our institute, Professor Białenicki. And there was also many experiments conducted, starting like, in different systems, starting with atoms and molecules, electrons, Bose-Einstein condensate. But it was usually a spatial Tem uh, spatial Talbot effect in which we had some matter wave like created, for example, with electrons or BC condensate and put a thread grating. But we also had a closer experiment related to this our quantum car carpet setup in which we had a, a temporal one. So, for example, we have a Bose Einstein condensate put in the harmonic trap. Then we print a phase. So we 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 print, a, uh, let's say, a phase that is uh, oscillatory. So it's like an analog of the grating. And then look at the evolution. Uh, and we can see that at some time there is a fractional revival, meaning that uh, this is initial, initial time. And for example, in this time, we can see that we have a revival. Uh, we have several copies of the initial state. This is called a fractional revival. And in the end, we have almost full revival. It's, it's almost perfect. So I'm going to tell you why our quantum carpets are different. So uh, let me start with many-body quantum carpet. Uh, this, is on, this is only introduction. So instead of a probability density, I will consider a quantity this which is called a single particle density, which is basically we can interpret it in the classical limit as the as the density of the gas and for our, for all of our purposes right now we will be interested in this quantity x is x1 uh, x, x is x1 exactly x. yeah in here no, no, but L of x1. Uh, yeah uh, either here is x and here is x or uh, yeah, in here is x1, or like this x1 is x. This, this, this is the same thing. So for all of our purposes, we just, this is a, for a non-interacting case, let's say. So we have an ideal gas of fermions, and to get this one particle density, we have to sum the contribution from all of the orbitals. And or by orbital, I mean the state of each of the, electro of the, of the atoms. So in order to get this density, just like the square of modulus of each of the orbitals. So that's why the quantum, many-body quantum carpet will appear when we add contribution from each of the, of the atom. So we start with five atoms, five different quantum carpets, each of them that sits in the small part of the whole box, in the ground state, first excited state, second, ex uh, second excited state, and so on. This is one particle, second, three, third, and so on. So the quantum carpet for this situation look like this. And as you can see, the details get smaller and so on. But you cannot, at first sight, you don't expect that if, you, if I add them up, I will get something which is uh, coherent and we, we will have some peculiar pattern. 
like the the first the first thought is that just they just add up to a constant uh, ca constant density at the limit of large number of atoms. So let's see what happens with that two of two of them, three of them, four of them, and five of them. As you can see, these structures get gets thinner and they are more pronounced. So our hypothesis is that if we add even more uh, atoms, it will get even more pronounced. So here is the comparison again between one and five of them. And here we, can co we have a comparison between five and 20. Yes. This is the quantum carpet, this is our quantum carpet, in which we have like this background of almost constant, uh, constant uh, density and this almost pencil, uh, pencil written, pencil drawn lines, which behave like, uh, like solitons. Like that's why we are calling them. What is the parameter that fixes the size? Uh, the, the, the width. I'm going to go tell about this later because we have an analytical expression for that. So, so the larger and the uh, narrower lines? Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, I will tell it in a, in a moment, but it depends on the initial Fermi wave factor of the cloud. So initial energy of the cloud. So, so as, as we can see, when uh, Kinsel saw a mountain range, he probably saw some, only some hills. And as you can see in, for our quantum carpet, here we have a five atoms, we can see like bigger mountains, like Tatra mountains or even Himalayas. It's much harder to climb. So this is all when it comes to the beautiful pictures. And now it's the time for the, for the equations. So uh, we are starting with the ideal Fermi gas. And this is the answer for the many body wave function, which is just a one later determinant. And by this uh, big phase, I will denote initial orbital, so initial states of each of the particles. Right now, this is a non-interacting case. So they will just undergo a unitary evolution. Uh, and uh, I will, uh, when I will, uh, I will denote it by the big phi with the subscript small n, and the small n will denote each of the orbitals. And we put it in the box with the width of uh, L, and by small phi with the subscript k, I will denote the eigenmodes of the whole box, this box with the width of L. And by s to, to, to clarify all, all the uh, following uh, expression, I int I'm introducing the function lambda, which is just an overlap between the eigenmode of the, of the whole box and the initial orbital of, of the gas. So this is will be lambda of n and k. And of course, each of the orbitals undergo a unitary evolution. Which we just decompose it in, like each of the orbitals, orbitals is just decomposed it into the eigenmodes of the uh, of the well, and with some appropriate phase that comes from just the one D Schrodinger equation. This is obvious. This is not so obvious because if we take the square of this orbital, we can decompose it. We can se separate contribution moving with different velocities. In here, we can see like we can decompose. This is this is non-trivial. Like we can decompose this squared squ uh, to the parts which are solutions to the wave equation that move th with the certain velocity p v zero, and we can decompose this whole expression into the parts that are solutions of this wave equation and move this constant velocity, and the uh, coefficients are given by this lambda function. This overlaps. <coughs> and the, th there is additional part uh, which have like some cross terms, but it disappears in the limit of the large number of atoms. So it uh, only this part is because the, the the number of elements in this sum is much. Yeah, uh, and uh, from the mathemat mathematical point of view, it's just like the number of these terms is proportional to uh, number of orbitals in the end. And uh, the, the rest is much smaller. It's, I don't know the scaling back there, are like just a couple of them. What is the range of P? Hmm? What is the range of P? Range of... Ah, it's it just, uh, it just an integer. Oh, so, uh, so, so uh, it can be any integer. And po when I say positive P, I will mean... I'm going to go back to the... 
to this picture. Okay, whatever one. Uh, so p equals one will mean I w the slowest one. This is p equals two, and for the negative piece, it will be this is p minus one, p minus uh, two, and so on. So positive piece will be right movers and negative p left movers. And this velocity is the character characteristic velocity that is connected to the size of the of the well, and it's also connected to the time of the revival. So time of the revival is when the the slowest contribution starts with one uh, one wall, uh, bounces from the other wall and goes back and reproduces the initial step. Increase the range of p. The approximation gets better and better. When uh, I increase the range of Yeah, I have a sum over p. So how is this sum treated? How many values uh, of p you have to take to make it? Uh, I, I'm basically like I'm taking almost all of the p. Uh, when I calculate, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not plotting. I'm not plotting these pictures uh, with this approximation. I'm just plotting the full expression, and this is just to separate the contribution moving with different velocities. And we are, we are interested only in the contribution going with the constant velocity. And this is just the way to separate the whole sum. But Piers, of course, also in the full expression, in reality, we have a cut of because we check mm -hmm. that it's sufficiently high so that nothing depends. So K does not go to exactly. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, it is because this uh, function lambda is localized in case. So I will introduce a contribution that moves with the velocity pv0. So I'm taking for each of p, I'm taking part from each of the orbital and sum over all of the orbitals. So we have this expression for the contribution that moves with the velocity p. And in as, as you can as you could see, these contributions are localized at some trajectory, this constant velocity trajectories. So we evaluate this contribution at this peak and see what happens to the depth of this, of this contribution. So in, I introduce relative depth, which is just the ev evaluation, uh, the, this cont p, cont p contribution ev uh, evaluated at this, at this uh, trajectory over the average density of the gas, which is just a number of atoms over L. And after some calculations, which is uh, quite nice, you can see in our paper, uh, we can evaluate uh, this relative depth. S so starting, OK, I, I'm going to tell you about uh, each part. So starting with the sigma of p, it tells us whether the soliton is bright or dark, soliton-like structure, sorry. Here we have some, uh, some constant, 1 over big N. This is important times a Fourier transform, a, a, a cosine transform, of the initial single parti particle density of the gas, evaluated at a certain point, which is proportional to this p. So this is the depth, relative depth of the contribution going with the velocity p. So as you can see, if this, if this, uh, if this Fourier transform won't scale as linearly with n, the relative depth will go to zero. And this is what we wouldn't like to happen. So how to evaluate most easily this initial single particle density? We just take the Thomas Fermi approximation. Thomas Fermi approximation is just the semi-classical approximation, purely mean field. It's just the easiest way to calculate a single particle density of the gas. So for example, for a gas in the box, Fermi gas in the box, this is just a constant, constant density. So this is the expression for the Thomas Fermi approximation. And we can make a really uh, not, not very nice, but working in most of the cases approximation for this relative depth. The scaling is like the square root of the chemical potential with some dependence of big N over big N. So we would like to, to this relative depth to be constant. So for this chemical potential to be 
a quadratic in big N. So how do you get this relation of the chemical potential? We take it from the normalization condition uh, that comes with this Thomas Fermi approximation, and that's from where, where we can get this chemical potential. And we realize that this, uh, this normalization condition is the same as the WKB quantization condition. Uh, in the sense that uh, big N is replaced by a quantum number, but mathematically they are the same. So it means that the dependence of the WKB energy spectrum on this quant quantum number small n is identical to the big N number of atoms dependence of the chemical potential. So we are looking for the systems that have a quadratic spectrum in order to have this relative depth to be constant. And the easiest, the most simple, uh, the simplest one, the simplest system that exhibits like this, is just a, a gas in the box. Uh, this is just an infinite well. And it, it also tells us why this effect was not seen before in the literature. Because most of the papers that, uh, that considered uh, Fermi gas in, in the context of the quantum carpets, uh, started with the initial state that was a state of the uh, of the harmonic potential. So if you take a harmonic potential, the energy levels are linear in the quantum number. So the scaling of this relative depth is one over square root of big N. So they just disappear in the limit of the large number of atoms and it all averages to zero. So indeed, the choice of the, in of the initial trapping to be a box is preferred. So we need to have a box and release it to a, to a bigger box in order to have this constant relative depth of the structures. In here, this is just a this is just a box. This is just an infinite well potential. So, so this is just a constant depth. <laughs> So we we'll just restrict ourselves to the, this case, which are interesting for us, because at this point we don't have any any guarantee that this structure that has this relative depth will have a constant shape during the evolution, or even if they are localized. We just know that they at this trajectory they will have a, let's say, constant relative depth. But we can check it, and we checked it before as we just plotted the this uh, Fermi quantum carpet. So. Uh, we are taking as the initial trap a smaller box with the width of big D, uh, which is smaller, of course, the, 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 than, the, than L. And we can analytically evaluate the contribution coming from each of the orbitals when it comes to the relative depth. This is, the, this is, just, a full, this is just a Fourier transform, basically, of the, uh, of the box. And it's not a surprise that it, it is a sink. As yeah, th th this makes sense, right? The Fourier transform of the box is a sink. So, again, this function uh, sigma, which tells us whether it's bright or dark, and sink, which is a function of the, the width of the initial box, and uh, velocity p, or this integer counting the velocities. So, this is the, uh, the plot in which uh, this, v this depth, relative depths are plotted with respect to the initial width of the box. So, for example, let, let us take the initial, for example. So, in the left picture, we have a right movers, so P positive. Uh, <laughs> this sounds like a sickness, P positive. And in the right, we have left movers, uh, uh, so, so P negative. So, let's, for example, take D equals uh, 0.2. And we can see that the, the slowest one is, uh, is a dark one, then dark, 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 bright, bright. And in here, it will, for the right mover, it gives us bright, dark, bright, dark. So we can, say we can see that for each of the initial widths, we have a really complicated soliton-like uh, landscape. So this is our final quantum carpet. This is uh, like 70, 70 atoms. And we can see that we can, we can see up to eighth one. And they are all available in the experiment, uh, of course, in, with some approximation. So this is, re this is really nice. So I told you all about the 1D case. Let's go for the three-dimensional case, in which we, in the x direction, we have this initial situation with the box going to the larger box. 
And in the perpendicular, perpendicular spatial degrees of freedom, we have uh, some arbitrary trapping. So it can be are the box, harmonic, potential, whatever. And instead of this uh, single particle density, we are interested in the integrated profiles. We have this single particle density and integrated over the spatial degrees of freedom. And we got this expression, which is almost the same to the initial one, but with this change that instead of the quantum number small n, that was numbering the, uh, the initial orbitals, we have nx, which is a quantum number uh, associated with the x direction. So as you can see, if we have to fill uh, perpendicular degrees of freedom with atoms, the number of atom, the effective number of atoms will get smaller. So after some calculation, we realize we can calculate the shape of the solitons uh, in this 3D case. We have, this is the expression for the contribution with the velocity p, n p, which is a Dense, this is just a dense. Th this is the density. This is the uh, the same relative depth that was in the 1D case, and the shape of the soliton, like soliton-like structure, is sink in X. This is quite different from the usual soliton uh, soliton uh, uh, soliton in the with this nonlinearity, non which is usually a, a hyperbolic tangent, and this is. Try to expand yeah. in two directions exactly. at the same moment. Then it would be different. Uh, I can, for example, in one D, if we put. Yeah, yeah, like we put it in the, for example, in this smaller, uh, uh, smaller, smaller rectangle and release it to the bigger one. We will just instead of, uh, instead of this soliton-like structure, we will get like. Um, how how do I call it? Uh, I, d I I like the right name for it. It's like a, a sh yeah exactly. It's like a moving sheet, and uh, at the crossing of this. Oh, oh, okay, this is a hard pronunciation, right? Uh, so <laughs> at the crossing of this, <laughs> say it exactly. We have like a bullet which is exactly the soliton like structure that we have and it moves with the some velocity but we are interested like it's it just makes things more complicated we are just interested that we have a, a single, wall. single wall which is released to the bigger one and that's all and uh, this approximation works only well near the first zeros of this sync function so it just only gives it just it just gives us the correct shape of this of this uh, soliton like structure and that's all and this, uh, this constant eta is just some uh, numerical constant that, uh, that is different from different, exter different perpendicular trapping. And this is the fer Fermi wave factor of the initial cloud. So in the case of the, it wor this, this equation also works for the 1D. And it can give us an approximation for the width of the structure, which is proportional to one over this Kf. And this Kf differs depending on the case of the perpendicular trapping or in the 1D case. In 1D case, it's proportional to the number of atoms. So the width scales like 1 over number of atoms. So it means it's absolutely unreachable in the, in the experiment. Because even if you take like 1,000 of atoms, it's like much, much below the threshold for the, for the experiments. But with different external trappings, we have different uh, we have a different scaling with number of the atoms. So, for example, for the harmonic trap, the perpendicular harmonic trapping, we have a scaling with the like of the Kf, like a big n to the power one over five. So, if we put the the number that comes from the experiments ins inside it, we realize that it's indeed observable. For example, if we have a trap with the size of, like, let's say, 600 microns, and we put inside 5,000 atoms, and put it in the, let's say, one third of the whole box, uh, the the width of the structures will be several microns. The usual resolution of the experiment is like one, two microns, so it can be it can be seen. So, but all of these calculations are in the temperature equals zero. So let's 
answer the question what happens in the finite temperature, in the non-interacting case. So the short answer is that the depth is not diminished, which can be seen from the fact that contribution from each of the orbitals is roughly the same. This is a property of the, uh, of the fact that we took this box as an initial trapping. And, but the width is diminished. And, but it's not disastrous. For example, in the temperature, temperature like four Fermi energies, it's still like 50% of the initial width. So it still can be observed. So the realization is that it can even be observed in the case of the classical gas. But, and by classical, I mean the, that, that is the one that is governed by the, uh, by the Boltzmann distribution. Uh, so the statistics are not necessary to see this effect in higher temperature, but it is important to have a quantized spectrum. So it can be even see, seen in the cold gas, not in the ultra cold one. So this is all for the non-interacting case. Let us see two component repulsive gas. This will be fast. This we, we, we make a calculation in, in 1D. We have uh, two species of the Fermi gas. Let's say for, clar for clarity, sp spin down, spin up. And they interact via only via contact interaction, by, uh, only by the S-wave collisions. So, uh, the, and the interaction is repulsive between them. So each of the clouds on their own behave like a non-interacting gas, but they, rep they repel each other. And to, on, in order to make calculations, we just use uh, the same simple ansatz for the wave function, which is uh, only one slater. So this is like th this neglects all of the correlations and entanglement all and all of these quantum quantum stuff, let's say, non-classical stuff. Better, and we make some uh, time-dependent Hartree-Fock equations, which are we just solve them, and what we see, another movie. Uh, I closed it. Oh no, it's in here. Okay. So we have two species that go through each other, and these soliton-like structures are still present. But, uh, and we can see these two quantum carpets that unfold symmetrically and mirrored with each other. But after some time, these soliton-like structures disappear. They just disappear. And this is what we see. Okay, let me find the right slide. Okay, so this is a quantum carpet for a small interaction. As you can see, it goes well. Well, it's, it lasts for quite a long time, over to the full revival time. Then this is a large interaction. And as you can see, it disappears quite early. And for even stronger interaction, it, it ceases to appear at all. It doesn't appear. But after some time, uh, sorry, after, after if we increase the interaction even more, there, there is a phase transition. Instead of these two clouds, instead of going through each other, they start to, let's say, bounce off each other. There is uh, this initial artificial domain structure that we made is preserved for the large interaction, and it acts as a domain wall. And it's more or less an if, uh, a, a well. So for a strong interaction, we can see two of the ca two carpets. And they still last for only for a finite time. And then these appear. So, but this, this time, the stronger the interaction is, the coherence lasts the longer. Because, the, because this domain wall behaves like the infinite well potential for both of the species. And uh, we also made a connection with, uh, uh, because we wanted to know what is the, let's say, uh, what is the lifetime of these structures depending on G. We, uh, we, wanted to, uh, we, want, we just wanted to associate it with something, so, and so we made uh, this, this nice picture. I'm going to tell you what's in the <laughs> axe. Uh, what are in the different axes. So here we have just a th evolution. Different colors mean different interactions, and different lines 
mean diff different orbitals. So here we have tw 12 orbitals. And in the vertical axis, th uh, there is a kinetic energy of these orbitals plotted. So st when we start, uh, we have just like these consecutive levels occupied. And then in the evolution, we can see that they just go to some constant value. So the, the faster this uh, diminution of the or daring of this orbital happens, the stronger the interaction is. So uh, as you can see, for a small interaction, it happens almost after, uh, let's say in here, after one something uh, revival times. And for a very strong interaction, it happens very fast. And uh, we can see that this time in which this dynamical equilibrium, in which no ordering is, uh, is seen of the orbitals, uh, is connected to the time of the, of the lifetime of the structure, of the solitone-like structures. So uh, we can see that when the system enters this dynamical equilibrium, the, our, our quantum carpet dies. So uh, we also made uh, some observation that the structure of this uh, dynamical equilibrium, if we average over all, uh, over all time and over all of the kinetic energies, the, the histogram of these kinetic energies is a Gaussian profile. That was, th th that was all that was in the paper that we put on the archive, so that was the last part. Uh, but uh, we have two quite natural, quite natural routes to extend our formalize our, our idea. So the first one is quite obvious to so include correlations in, the, in this quantum carpet. Uh, so we, ha we just have to take a more, uh, more realistic ansatz which incorporates correlations in it, in it. So for example, Slater, the Astrof one, and see what happens to this time of the coherence of this quantum carpet. Whether for, we have to ask ourselves question whether, for example, correlation can like, make, make these coherence times longer or not. So this is one route. The second route is to just to consider different systems. It was, of course, done in many different systems. To, uh, I mean, like many people checked whether there is a quantum carpet in many different systems, but we still could imagine different systems that in which we can s see this quantum carpet, and that was not explored before. Adam, how much time do you have? To the ah, it's two ten past. Okay, so. Uh, that was supposed to be an end, but I'm gonna answer a question that was not asked. It was <laughs> but because uh, this is like the first time I'm doing this presentation, and during the previous two times, Professor Mostowski asked me a question. What's quantum about this quantum carpet? Because all that he saw was just, uh, was just uh, some interference of waves. So, so he just told me that we can imagine a membrane, in which we just like excite part of this membrane, release it, and see what happens. Yeah, because I didn't, but I thought that. Yeah, and the, the and, and the second one was neither. So <laughs> I was expecting him today, but <laughs> so instead of a membrane, we can imagine a string, which is basically the same, right? So we have a string which have these clips that musician, um, musicians use to shorten their strings. So it's like, hmm? Yeah, to tune it. And uh, let's say we have two of them in here. We have a s perfect string. We put another clip in here and let's say excite this thing. And the experiment would go like this. We just release these two clips and let it evolve. And that, that was the idea of Professor Mot Mostowski. But and I was curious how I made calculations. But obviously, the <laughs> it, it, this is just an ideal string. So this distortion will just propagate along this string, <laughs> bounce, it, bounce back, and go in here. So there will be no quantum carpet. Exactly. Because, there is the, the, because the dispersion relation of the ideal string is trivial. So I can, I can imagine that uh, we cannot do it in the, with the string, but we could do, for example, do it with a water. So we just have a container. We have a container of water, put water only in this part, and release this wall. 
because the because we have different regimes of dispersion relations for water. For example, we have a shallow water, deep water, and so on. So so I so I can imagine that we could find the regime. That is not a good example because the experiment has been done. Yeah, and it was. Yeah. Okay, so it won't happen. But I can imagine a similar system in which the which has the non-trivial dispersion relation, which means that the waves with different lengths will go with different velocities, uh, in which we could reproduce this quantum color. But this is just a just a guess. This is this I guess answer. Yeah. Some kind of I guess so. Please, this is this is the end. So. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think there are more questions to which you want to answer. <laughs> the the question is, as far as I understood, uh, in all these calculations, you always enlarge the box. Yeah. What happens when you make it slightly smaller? Uh, it's. Uh, yeah, 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 squeeze. Yeah. Uh, you mean like we have a situation in which we have uh, some eigenstate of the whole box and then put infinite no, 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 in between? No, 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 no. You have to move. So, okay, so yeah. like really. Yeah, then uh, really this, this what you said doesn't differ from the previous calculation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that was supposed to be my answer. Uh -huh. But if, if, we, if we do it very quickly, I don't know, it's very complicated dynamics. It's it's really complicated. But uh, but you can do this. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you can so because there's a, obviously a next question. Mm -hmm. What happens if you shake the? Yeah, yeah. That's if you have a, yeah. and that uh, uh, that you can do within the in the thermodynamical limit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can study the problem. What happens and uh, uh, that has actually been done. And th this is quite connected to the experimental environment because I don't know. I mean, we, did a, we, we did this calculation 25 <laughs> years ago, so we don't have any idea of experiments of today. Yeah, I, I, and I, I had forgot the calculation. <laughs> <laughs> I just meant that the walls in the experiment that are just like being done by laser, they have like some, they they shake. They are not. This is a very small shaking. The, the but only problem which I remember now mm -hmm. is that if you f if you have the problem, ask for many bosons mm -hmm. in a shaky box and many fermions. The answers is different, and the uh, and if you have a ask what happens to the Bose condensate mm -hmm. in a shaky box, then you can have the nice phase diagram in which you can show that by sh by oscillating or, I mean, randomly shaking the box, you can destroy the condensate for a certain probability distributions mm -hmm. of, the, of the box. And for fermions, then there is no was a condensate. But if you, if you take a model of a fermion, many fermion system, which is superconducting within the box, and you try to shake the box, then all of a sudden the critical temperature for super, super Conductivity increases. So yeah, that is a the question or a comment, Professor Jonges. I have a small comment. The problem missing for this mm. very mixed audience is the very important is a very important argument. Uh, considering ideal Fermi gas is not a bad approximation, it's excellent mm -hmm. approximation, just because of the anti symmetry mm -hmm. required, the cross section for scattering vanishes at very low energy. Mm -hmm. So Indeed, there is almost ideal Fermi gas available in many labs. Yeah, exactly. Going back to Mastowski's remark, I think this is quantum because it's fermionic. Yeah. Um, th there are no classical fermions. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, we, we can make a classical system that is an analog of this quantum situation. This is because this is all, all, all based of this wave nature. Uh, in the Schrodinger equation.
models, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, if I take a wire, mm -hmm. and there is no voltage applied, metallic wire, mm -hmm. then the conducting electrons in that wire are basically a free current. Right? So if the wire has the ends, it's not connected to anything, that's your box. Mm -hmm. And suppose I take a pliers and I cut the box in the middle. That should be very trivial experiments to do. No, no cool temperature, no sophisticated materials, just a parameter or voltage meter. I cut it in half, so I have a smaller one the same. The same. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it, well, it all depends what... what Yeah, it al also the states disappear. Yeah. You have different boundary conditions. But, but the same here. The yes. States very different. You have to expand the old ones in the new ones, and yeah. then you go. The only problem so is that in addition to expanding this with the length, you also have to change the number of particles. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which you miss, right? Okay. So you have another degree of freedom in this calculation. Mm -hmm. But that would that would be the idea that. Yeah, but sure. it, it also depends on what, what is the initial state of the whole wire, right? The box. Yeah, it's probably... The wire is a box. I mean, yeah, I, uh, I can okay. imagine that it's a good okay. idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I have a simple question. So this whole quantum revival feels to me like what? something similar to the uh, Poincaré's theorem about return. Sorry, sorry. At the same time, Okay, the, th the thing is that, uh, is there any connection between quantum revival and the Poincaré's theorem about the return? I mean, I, I, I've never dug deep into that, but there is a connection between those two, yeah. I mean, like, I saw some quantum theorems on the quantum, quantum analogs of quant Poincaré theorems okay. about the revival. It's about Actually, this feeling, it as I said before, about this feeling, the classical orbit. Actually, it's not a question, it's a comment to uh, Mikolai's question. Uh, the return theorem would probably be more relevant in cases where the spectra are not quadratic but uh, uniform. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments? If no, let's thank Piotr once again.